Hi, welcome to Funk Rhythm Chops. My name is Alan Slutsky. Some of you may be familiar with me through the various music books and guitar and bass and keyboard magazine articles I've written under my Dr. Lick's pen name. I'd like to welcome you to the wonderful and weird world of funk guitar, and hopefully I can show you a few things that'll get you moving and grooving. In the course of this video, I'm going to present a good cross-section of the concepts that I believe to be at the core of what funk guitar is all about. These aren't necessarily rules or anything like that. They're just observations that I've made from years of studying and playing in this style. You'll learn about the most popular funk guitar chord voicings, uh, some of the more important techniques, and you'll learn something about the important players and historical figures through the examples that will be pre presented in the course of this video. Why don't we tune up first? Okay, here's the high E. B string. G. D string. The A. And the low E string. Okay, now that we're in tune, let's get started. Before we get into it, I think an explanation of a few basic concepts and terms would help you a lot to understand the musical examples that are going to be coming at you. First thing I like to talk about is muting and choked chords. Now, muting involves taking your right hand with this part of your hand, the meat of your right hand, and putting it on the bridge so that instead of getting this, you get this. It's a dull percussive thud. And what happens is that adds to the percussive nature of what this music is all about. So if you have a funk line, something like this, when you mute it, you put your hand down here and you get, takes on a whole different character. Now, in terms of chords, uh, sometimes we call these choke chords and what happens is if you're playing something like that and you alternate it with this where there's absolutely no pitch it's just a percussion instrument at this point the way you do that is you're pressing down here and it's ringing keep your fingers the exact same place but just release pressure don't push down to the fingerboard and that gives you this so So that's the choke chord concept. Now that's going to come up constantly in the course of anything you ever play in funk guitar. The next topic I'd like to get into is the topic of chord inversions. Uh, funk guitarists are basically street musicians. They're not schooled, they're not, uh, they didn't go to Berkeley or they didn't go to uh, uh, GIT or one of these places. They're, they learn what they learned on the street and they make the most out of what they have. So if you say to a jazz guitarist, play a C minor 7, he's going to go like this. And then he's got this one, and then he's got this one. He's got millions of them all over the neck. Funk guitarist, you say C minor 7, boom. Or maybe this, that's about it. They work basically off of the three main inversions. You have a root position inversion. I'm going to take G, for example. Here's first inversion. Here's second inversion. These on the bottom here, the fifth of the chord, the third of the chord, the root of the chord. And what they do is they take these chords and they play smaller portions of these chords, three note chords. And that's how you get these kind of licks like... It's all coming off these three different positions. Okay, the next thing I'd like to talk about is the scales that are going to be featured throughout this video. Now, almost everything is going to be pentatonic. Uh, it'll either be major pentatonic or minor pentatonic. Minor pentatonic is the blues scale, the blues box that we all know in C. Uh, that's the C blues scale or C minor. The major pentatonic is the same thing as the major scale, just minus the fourth and seventh degrees. So, for instance, if you play C major, if you leave out the fourth and seventh degrees, you get. 
So that's uh, basically the two scales we're going to be using. Now, a few other concepts. One is pick speed. Now, I'm sure you've all heard in baseball the term bat speed. Like if you listen to a great hitter talk about the science of hitting, he's talking about bat speed and how necessary it is to, to cross the plate with a lot of speed. Same thing with a pick. Uh, Bill Levitt, who is the legendary head of the Berkeley Guitar Department for like three decades, always used to talk about pick speed. And he would refer to it as flicking away like a fly, like that. See how fast my hand traveled across the strings? The faster your hand travels, the more percussive it is. You really have to dig in in this style. You can't be scrubbing away like it doesn't make it. That's for a 50, like a more of a 50 style behind Jackie Wilson when you're going. You know, you really want to nail it, get percussive on every chord voicing you hit. Now the next uh, topic I like to hit on a little bit is sliding into chords. If you're a jazz bassist, you're always going to approach notes and different chords from a half step, like you'll hear a, a bass line, like... Well, what happens is, in funk guitar, you might be on an E9 for 20 minutes, especially if you're in James Brown's band. So what happens is, uh, there's no harmonic motion. So the way you get harmonic motion is sliding into chords. So you, if you're funking away on an E9 chord and you're going... You might want to just liven it up a little bit by going. The thing you have to remember above all is that funk is body music. It's physical music and you have to get physically involved. Uh, a lot of times you'll see funk guitarists and they look like they're in ecstasy. Their heads are moving around and their, their legs are pumping and everything is completely involved in the music. If you just sit there like a totem pole, uh, you're going to play like that. So don't be afraid to, to uh, get a little rambunctious with the rest of your body parts. So, okay, let's get into it. The very first uh, example I'd like to do, uh, when you start any discussion about funk guitar, you've got to talk about the godfather. And you probably think I'm talking about James Brown, but I'm not. James is the godfather of soul. Jimmy Nolan, on the other hand, his guitarist, is the godfather of funk guitar. Now, Jimmy exploded on the R&B guitar scene in 1965 with his uh, famous Papa's Got a Brand New Bag Lick. I'm sure you all know that. This brings us to our first important guitar chord in funk and our first important funk guitar concept. Whenever I think of Jimmy Nolan, my hand immediately goes like this. Boom. Or sometimes at the, at the uh, sixth position. It's either an E-flat 9 or an E-9. Uh, that was Jimmy's signature chord voicing. And in the next few years following Papa's Got a Brand New Bag, Jimmy took this chord and he continually morphed it through rhythmic variations until his uh, early R&B roots slowly evolved into what we now call funk. The way he did this was he increased the rhythmic complexity of his figures, particularly in regards to syncopating off the 16th note. So in other words, uh, an example of that would be da 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 See, now that's off a 16th note. An older kind of feel is syncopating off the 8th notes, like boo bop bop Like... That's a much older, late 50s, early 60s kind of uh, R&B feel. That was pre-funk. Uh, the first example I'm going to play utilizes both Jimmy's ninth chord voicing and the 16th note syncopation approach. Here's the example. Now, as you can see, it's based off this E ninth chord. Right at the fifth position, you put your first finger right here fifth fret on the D string and your third finger bars at the sixth fret, the top three strings. Now the thing is, what you're going to do is you're going to favor the top three strings. A lot of times that first finger won't even sound. So you're going to go slide up and back. Now that's the sixteenth note syncopation I was talking about. Let's check it out with the rhythm section. One, two, three, Four. Jimmy 
Nolan wasn't the only great funk guitarist that James Brown carried in his band. He also had Alfonso Country Kellum, Phelps Catfish Collins, who just happens to be Bootsy Collins' brother, Robert Coleman, and my personal favorite, Herlon Cheese Martin. I could have had a name like that, but somehow, I don't know, Herlon Slutsky don't make it. Well, anyway, James Brown referred to all these guys as chankers, and what he was referring to was the guitar style that had evolved in his band since Jimmy Nolan first in introduced that ninth chord. Uh, James Brown's guitarists now wore two hats. They were guitarists and they were percussionists. And they did this by introducing percussive muted chords or choke chords into their strum. Okay, now in this next example, all the right hand is doing is strumming constant 16th notes. It's just going like this. Totally no-brainer. Right hand just constantly moves. What makes all the rhythms is the left hand muting or choking the chords in specific places and alternating them with pressing down to the fingerboard to let the, uh, to let the guitar chord sound. The actual rhythm of the chord voicing is... Now when you add in between all those accents the, the choke notes, you get this. It's almost like a duet between a horn section punching bop, 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 bop while the drummer plays the percussive rhythms in the holes. And the composite or total rhythm of this Cheese Martin guitar part is just a constant flow of 16th notes as opposed to the previous example in which uh, Jimmy Nolan uh, did a basically a kind of ninth chord voicing where he stopped and started. Breath, breath. This was the key to the James Brown style. Every instrument, in particular the guitar, was valued as much for its percussive contribution to the groove as its uh, harmonic or melodic content. Here's what it sounds like with the bass and the drums. One, two, three, four. You might have noticed in that last example that the snare is pretty prominent, and that's what you want to marry yourself to so you can figure where you fit in the lock. The snare is hitting on two and four, and you want to make sure that your pick is right there with the snare on those two beats. So you don't want to get a flam where it sounds like ba-da. It's got to be, when you're, when you're doing it right, your note disappears into the snare. So that's the key to, to uh, locking in with a groove like that. Now the next type of groove that I'd like to present is a totally different uh, approach because it's aggressive. Instead of laying back a little bit like I was in the previous one, I want to be like dead on the beat, maybe even a little bit in front of it because this is kind of a very uh, forceful, aggressive kind of groove. One, two, three, four. See what I mean about how aggressive that was and uh, how you have to be right on top of that groove or it will get away from you. The bass and the drums constantly support the guitar playing in unison on most of the important accented spots. Like whenever you go, the bass is right with you kicking. Uh, the guitar part is extremely syncopated as you could tell. It's based, I want to sound like a broken record. Uh, the inversions that I talked about earlier, this is right off the second inversion and it's a D minor 7th chord and we're sliding, just like I talked about earlier right into the chord and it's broken up by these percussive muted notes it keeps everything moving forward when you strum those, those choke chords 
Uh, there's also an interesting voicing. Uh, when you slide like that, you're basically doing a Dorian thing. It's almost kind of like Miles Davis uh, on So What. So what's happening is your looks like a little G triad going to an F triad, but the G, the top three notes are part of this E minor seven. The top three notes of this F triad are part of a D minor seven. And then you jump up here, that's a voicing in fourths. It's just another D minor seven. It's actually a, a D minor seven with an 11. And then you punch with everybody on the end of it. So let me play it all together so you can see how the parts fit. Three, four. Now the next vamp that I like to get into is a cool in the gang type of thing, or fang, as they would probably say. And it's the exact opposite of the previous groove. Uh, Pocket-wise, this is extremely laid back. And in terms of being supported uh, from the rest of the band, like in the last example, you know, you had the band kicking on. Well, in this, in this example, you can forget it. Uh, there just isn't that kind of support. Most of what's happening in the bass and the drum parts is going on in the rhythmic holes left in the guitar part and vice versa. Everything's kind of weaving in and out of each other rhythmically uh, like a tapestry. So uh, this is what it sounds like. One, two, three, four. There's a few basic chord voicings in this one that I'd like to point out. The main voicing is this E7. Now, where's that come from? Relating back to this root position, first inversion, second inversion thing. Here's your first inversion E chord. That's the seventh version. And all we're doing is bringing this B up to the top string. And we're going back and forth between the E and a half step below. Then we're filling in a little bit in the middle with some percussive muting. And then we're sliding up into a G add nine chord. Now where's this one coming off of? There's your first inversion G, add the nine, and we're just basically shortening it to a three note voicing. Uh, one of the things you'll find in this style is that we're constantly using three note voicings, two note voicings. And this is not the kind of style that's like Neil Young uh, singing down by the river with big six note bar chords. You don't need that kind of big wide pad because usually it's supplied by either the vocalist or a keyboard or maybe the horns. Uh, it's a much more economical style. Uh, just like in a big band, if you want to make the horn section move fast, you don't do large spread voicings with the root on the bottom of the baritone. You get nice tight voicings and that's what's happening here. So uh, after we play this G, add nine chord, we go back to this, and then we have a little situation where we play a D7 sus, which again is right off second inversion D, and just a little pickup muted to bring us back to the top. So when you play the whole thing slowly, it sounds like this. If you're talking funk in the same breath when you mention James Brown, you have to include George Clinton's various Parliament funkadelic concoctions. This is a two-bar chord vamp that uh, is fairly easy to play, and it gives you a little bit of everything. It's basically an A Dorian kind of a groove that features this four-note A minor seven voicing to a three-note B minor seven voicing. Now both of them come right off the root positions. Here's A minor, here's your big root position bar chord. We shorten it up. And the interesting thing about this particular voicing is you have a second on the top, which really pops through. Then you go to this three note voicing, like here's, that's a full five note uh, bar chord 
B minor 7 voicing, so we're just turning it into a three note. B, D, A. There's the A minor 7. There's the B minor 7. The rhythms are fairly simple, and they all happen on downbeats of uh, beats 1 and 3. And there's a few percussive muted chords thrown in to keep things moving along. Now let's do it in tempo slowly. Three, four. So let's see how it sounds with the rhythm section. One, two, three, four. I'm going to stay in phaser land for one more song. Uh, some may claim that this next example is borderline disco, but I don't think anybody in their right mind could deny that Nile Rodgers uh, created some of the funkiest guitar grooves around. See what I mean? One, two, three, four. This is a fairly simple four bar phrase where there's one chord per measure. The first chord is E minor 7. Second chord, you just extend your fourth finger and you make it E minor 7 with an 11. The third chord is an A sus, A suspended, which is coming off this root position bar chord and you just grab that D. And the fourth chord is an A6 chord. It looks like this. Now, this is a very old R&B chord uh, they used in Kansas City and songs like that. Now, all these chords are being played fairly straight ahead rhythmically. There's not a lot of syncopating in this thing. The only syncopation that really comes is from pressing the chords down to the neck uh, in, co in conjunction with the percussive muting. Basically, what you're having... Uh, in that first bar is bop, 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 mm, bop. So the only syncopated note is on the fourth beat uh, on the second sixteenth. So it's basically. Now what happens is when you put that uh, with the muted chords, you get. Now the second bar, which is the E minor 11, is straight eighth notes. On the, four, on the fourth beat, you start with 16th notes and you go. So I'm basically playing those almost all downstroke. Down, 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 down. When I get to the 16th, I do alternate stroke. And then the exact same strum applies to the third and fourth bars. So let's play the whole thing uh, a little slow. So you can play along with me. Three, four. I'd like to take a 20-year quantum leap right now into the mid-90s and see what's happening with funk right now. Groups like Living Color, the Red Hot Chili Peppers, and others have just taken funk and up the ante. It's much more aggressive and louder, but the same principles still apply. This particular example starts out with an intro that features a ringing 16th note strum that acts as a chord pad, and then it breaks into a choppier, more aggressive feel in the vamp. Let's check it out with the rhythm section. One, two, three, four...
This groove features two different sections that use the same exact chords but in a totally different way. The first one is based upon a very sustained chord pad. You don't pump your fingers or anything, you just hold them there. So basically what you have is a voicing in fourths, CFB flat, which is just a C7 sus, and then you resolve it. No accents, no anything, just... And it just provides a nice pad for all these incredible things happening in the bass. The second section where it gets more aggressive, you do the same exact thing up at the top of the neck, exactly an octave above, but this time you have a percussive rhythm. So each thing is a three note attack, one, two, three. The note in the middle is that, so it's...